That was a big photo of me. How are you all doing? Excellent. Yeah, you full up with grub? Did it come from a cow or was it 3D printed? I picked up a little. I picked up one of these little pamphlets earlier that you get from the back when you sort of when you get your name tags and everything else. And it says here, "We cannot predict the future, but we can invent it." Now, I hope I, I would actually really have liked someone to have told me that about two years ago when I first started building the company that I'm now building. My name is Matthew Griffin. I am a futurist, and I do predict the future. Um, fortunately, I've, for me, I've got two beautiful young children. Uh, I have Caden, who's six years old. He wants to be a rocket engineer. And since we're in the company of startups, you know, as I say, I started my company two years ago, so I still consider my company, basically, to be a startup. Yeah, my daughter wants to be a unicorn. She's four, and I think that's a great thing to be. I mean, how many four-year-olds basically would want to run their own multi-billion-dollar startup? But I'm not too sure whether she actually means that or whether she means the animal with a horn on its head. Uh, but anyway. This photo here, I think, is quite emblematic of our time. This is the Eagle Creek fire that uh, took hold in the US a little while ago. And the reason why I think this is a, quite a good photo is because most of the CEOs that I talk to around the world of, sort of Fortune 250, FTSE 100 organizations either see disruption coming and then do nothing about it, business as usual, or they never see it coming. Unfortunately, accelerators and communities like this, we start surfacing some of these disruptions and organizations and incumbents can do something about it. Now, from a technology perspective, incumbents always talk about technology as being a great force multiplier. As startups, we talk about technology being a great leveler. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, technologies that we're creating today that might make you raise an eyebrow. But we're also going to disrupt five industries. And you can join me in that journey. The company that I founded two years ago, uh, we're a futures think tank. We work between the dates of 2020 and 2070. We now consult for the world's top 10 consulting firms. So if you go and ask them what the future holds, they will typically come back to us. And then we tell them, and then they charge you all a huge fee. However, some of the things that we're doing, are, I think, are quite interesting. We work with Area 2071 on the Dubai government. So if you go out to Dubai and you get into a flying car, you get onto a Mach 1 train, you take an autonomous journey, you visit a 3D printed skyscraper, that's us. We work with companies like BlackRock, BCG, Centrica. I sit on the Technology and Innovation Committee for Centrica. This is where we are trying to reinvent Centrica. So Centrica obviously own British Gas and the like. I work with companies like Huawei. So for any of you that have a smartphone and Samsung, we are inventing the next 20 years of smartphones and the things that come after them. And if you want to figure out how you reinvent the smartphone, the biggest problem that you have is getting rid of the screen. Get rid of the screen, you can do all sorts of things with it. With Lloyd's Banking Group, we talk about Lloyd's Banking Group being able to be disrupted by a toaster. That's a fun conversation to have, basically, with their board. Uh, and then with the US Air Force, we're doing all sorts of things, such as creating biological computers and turning bacteria into, com into computing devices that can store information and replay movies. And then Qualcomm, again, we talk about the future of intelligent machines and the future of semiconductors and the electronics industries. So there's lots of sort of bits and pieces. Now, how many of you believe in magic? See, anytime I ask this question, there's always only a couple. Now, if we step back a couple of hundred years ago and I start showing you technology like this, just to present, you know, just light, for example, just artificial light, you would think it's magic. If I show, if I go back far enough in time and I show you a mirror, you think it's magic. Let alone any of the technologies that we have today. But typically, magic is a phenomenon that we don't understand. And when we, someone shows us something that's new and we don't understand it, we think it's a trick. We think it's magic. Increasingly today, basically all of the things that we used to think of as magic basically are becoming real. So alien life forms. Last year, we created a six base pair DNA alien life form. 
All of us have something in common with the dinosaurs. If you step back three and a half billion years ago, we all have four base pair DNA. These things are unique. They are completely different. Now, if I showed you any of these particular bacteria and said, should you care about any of these, you'd probably tell me, I don't care about six base pair alien life forms, except maybe for them getting into the wild. But these things can revolutionize healthcare and technology. DNA storage devices, if you use the DNA that's in these devices, which Microsoft are going to do in 2020, you can store information in the cloud, you can store the whole internet in a shoebox, let alone anything else. You can turn humans into biological computers as well, and we've done that. Deflector shields. If you step back basically to the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, deflector shields, force fields, whatever you want to call them, were science fiction. But nowadays, if you fire a laser at the upper part of the atmosphere, you can create something called a Fermi lens effect. It's a deflector shield that deflects lasers. British Aerospace have built one. Hive mines. At the moment, we are joining machines together, but if you take robots and you take different connected devices and machines and you connect them to the cloud and you infuse the cloud with artificial intelligence, you get robots with hive minds. You teach one robot something, it teaches the rest of the fleet. You take a self-driving car, the self-driving car has one experience, it teaches the rest of the fleet. Eventually, we will get to the point where we, are, where we will, will uh, increasingly hook animals up to these hive minds. We've already done that with rats. We connected a rat, basically, in one continent in South America, trained it how to run a maze. We then connected it via just a brain-machine interface to another rat in New York, and that rat learned how to go around the maze. In fact, it knew how to go around the maze already. So neuroscience is quite an interesting field at the moment. Holograms, how many of you have sort of watched science fiction films where everything is a hologram? Whether it's Minority Report, whether it's uh, Blade Runner with huge holographic adverts playing on the buildings. This is from last year. There are two types of these now. This is the world's first free form, free air, living hologram. It is not augmented reality, it doesn't use glasses, it doesn't use glass or tricks or anything like that. So when we talk about being able to bring magic to life, if I showed you that, you might think it's magic, because you don't know how it's done. But when I explain that this thing is actually nanocellulose cellulose particles suspended in air that are then irradiated with, lent with uh, different colored lasers, magic tricks broken. Today, these things are about this big. Later the uh, next year, they'll be this big, and it just scales. So the technology gets faster, cheaper, and more ubiquitous. Knowledge uploading. About three years ago, we took 36 candidates in uh, the US military. We took we put them into uh, sim you know, flight simulators. So these were the Top Gun pilots, basically, from the US Air Force. Put, brains, you know, put skull caps onto them. Took them up to 35,000 feet in a F-35 simulator. Put the F-35 into a flat spin at 35,000 feet, dropped it. All of those Top Gun pilots were able to land the planes. What we then did is we then took 36 other volunteers who'd never been in an aircraft before, put the skull caps on them, replayed the brain waves into their heads, ostensibly, 80% of them landed the F-35s. No previous flight experience. The critics at the time said, well, OK, you've just uploaded knowledge because the human mind is actually plastic. Speak to any neuroscience or any neurosurgeon, mostly the brain is plastic. We can do this. It's just a question of understanding the trick. And uh, the critics at the time said, but the effect only lasted 30 minutes. To which point, the researchers involved said, you missed the friggin' point. Molecular assemblers, at the start of this year, we created a whole host of molecular-sized robots, created a molecular-sized production line, and then created molecular-sized products. In the 1960s, we were told that molecular assemblers will never, ever exist. 
but each one of you are a molecular assembler. They now exist. And we also have DNA robots that can do that as well. And all this stuff, by the way, is online. You want to go and look at the research papers, you want to go and see the videos and everything else, go online. You want to speak to the researchers, feel free. Neural streaming. What if we could take all the things that you're thinking in your heads and I could stream them to the screen? I know what you're thinking. That's not funny. I'll get off. I'm going to get off in a minute, all right? So what we have here is we have neural, live neural streaming from a patient. And while these pictures are a little bit grainy, I think you'll agree, typically, you can see what the image is. Yeah? They look similar. Three years ago, these were really grainy. They were even grainier. They were sort of quite horrible. In about another three years, these will be better. We've also been able to stream movies from people's heads, but they're really quite bad. But what we're doing here is we're using an fMRI machine, we're using skull caps, we're using artificial intelligence to decode the electrical activity of billions of neurons that are firing in people's heads and decode them and put, create an image out of them. And it's actually not that hard. That's kind of the scary thing about some of this stuff. And this is getting better all the time. Telepathy. In 2015, we created the first human telepathic, te telepathic link uh, at Harvard, where a person connected to a skull cap was connected to another person with a skull cap, and then they communicated. And there's a couple of ways that they did that. Tractor beams. Again, science fiction. You know, if you sort of watch Star Trek and all these kinds of things, you always see Klingon and starships being pulled around basically with a tractor beam. Um, but this is now where, from a CEO perspective, if you went to a CEO, for example, of a, Fortune, of a FTSE 100 company and said, I've created a tractor beam, I would like more funding, he'd say, bog off. Yeah. But this is where we now start applying some of these science fiction-esque technologies, basically, to real-world applications to do, things, to do things that we've never, ever done before. So here, what we're doing is we're using ultrasound. They're, kind of, they're called ultrasound tornadoes, because they do this. We're using ultrasound tornadoes. This is from the University of Bristol, but also the University of New York have created these to manipulate objects. In this case, it's a blob, but it could also be water. It could be literally anything. It could be sold or all kinds of stuff. And there you see. About five years ago, this was at the molecular scale. Now we're at objects like ball bearings and things a little bit bigger. However, if you combine a tractor beam with a 3D printer, you get this. And we're getting closer to being able to 3D print semiconductors and all those kinds of bits and bobs. What you have is you have a 3D printer that can print components and self-assemble components. You've revolutionized manufacturing. And again, as these things get better and bigger and cheaper and more ubiquitous and more available and everything else, the things that you can do with them, the th companies that you can disrupt, the industries that you can transform and change and disrupt, improve. But again, from a CEO's perspective, if you go to a CEO and say, I think that as a startup, I have a good idea. I've got a good product, and I think I can disrupt your industry. The majority of CEOs, even today, will typically say, not a chance. So can you say that with me? What's the likelihood that you can disrupt an entire industry if you're an individual or a small startup? That's it, see? Excellent, you're a CEO. See, he is a CEO, literally. I didn't say it, it's the guy behind <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. So a lot of what we're seeing today is actually thanks to what I call uh, the techno-Jurassic era. A lot of people think that change is a constant. You know, it's one of, these, you know, one of these popular phrases, change is a constant. It isn't. It's accelerating. We also typically think of innovation as being disruption. It isn't. Innovation combined with execution is disruption. 
So as startups and as a startup community, what we have over here is we have a lot of startups that have innovative ideas, have identified a need or a gap in the marketplace. They've then used technology, whatever that technology is, to build the ne their product or service. But if you really want to scale, if you really want to disrupt an industry, you've got to do it quickly. And this is where we talk about exponential adoption. But in order to disrupt an industry, firstly, you've got to do it relatively quickly. Secondly, your products have got to be accessible in the local market that you're selling into. They've got to be easy to adopt. If a product is hard to adopt, no one's going to buy it. Imagine the iPhone if it was just a kludge. Uh, we have cultural bias. You know, so we have some people who will like your new technology and your new way of doing things, and we will have people who don't. Geopolitics, play, that's playing a big part today. Network effects, we all know this. And for example, when you have a look at the Billion Journey project, this is what we're talking about with network effects. Because as a startup community, partnerships with incumbents that have scale, that have resources, that have vision, can help you change an industry very, very quickly. You all know this. And then there's regulators, and I work with plenty of regulators. And in fact, as we talk about regulators in the transportation industry, we're actually trying to create robo-regulators now. So off-gem, off-com, all these kinds of ones, that we have a way to turn the FCA into a fully autonomous regulator, and we're starting to do that today. So the point is, you identify a need, you build your next generation product or service, you tick the right boxes here, and these are damn hard to tick. And you start building a huge company. You start disrupting an industry. Yeah. However, you know, we always talk about emerging technologies. You know, if you have a look at Gartner, IDC, MIT, you know, we typically talk in terms of you know, 10, maybe 20 emerging technologies. There aren't 10 emerging technologies. There are hundreds. There are 170 emerging technologies on this radar. Each individual emerging technology, each dot, has a market opportunity of at least half a trillion dollars. You want to understand what the next product or service looks like? You want to understand how you could disrupt any industry? Everything is on here. So for example, Huawei basically have been using this. They're now the world's number two smartphone manufacturer. But on the one hand, they have some beautiful design and they've got some interesting technology. But again, they wouldn't have been able to get to the number two manufacturer status if they couldn't execute. But on here, we have all sorts of things. You know, we have advanced manufacturing. Uh, so here's one I thought of earlier. Who likes Crocs? No one. See, why do they even exist? If you're an investor in Crocs, sell. <laughs> 3D printing. Yeah, so when we have a look at 3D printing, you could 3D print a Croc at the moment today, but it would take you, re it would take you ages. Uh, this also works with implanted medical devices as well. If we take 3D holographic printing, it's kind of a liquid, uh, you can print a croc in two seconds. You can print an implanted medical device in two seconds. 3D holographic printing is a thousand times faster than traditional 3D printing, which is already starting to upend particular, you know, particular marketplaces. If we have a look, for example, at 3D printing in the transportation space, we have companies like Audi, Mercedes, BMW, starting to 3D print cars, as well as buses. There's a, a bus company called Otto 3D printing buses. Small ones, but still 3D printing them. And as we sort of you know, spin around this wheel, basically we have all sorts of different things. Gene, edit gene editing. Today, if you're born with an inherited genetic condition, such as Hunter's syndrome or Huntington's syndrome, you go to a GP, you go to a doctor, and you say, what are my chances? And I'll say, look, sorry to say, but um, you'll be dead in about 20 years' time, and it's, you're going to die a painful death. It sucks. Last year, in the NHS, we took CRISPR, which is a gene editing technology, and we corrected all of the faulty genes in a Huntington's patient. In vivo, gene editing removed an inherited genetic disease. He no longer has it. We can 3D print human hearts and organs and everything else. You think, basically, that the children are going to be living to the ripe old age of 70 or 80 when you can 3D print a brain? which again, we've actually done, let alone a heart or whatever it happens to be. Healthcare is being revolutionized. 
And this sort of keeps flipping around. If we have a look at machine systems, how many of you use artificial intelligence in your daily lives? Excellent. So three. It's fantastic. Who said that? Who talked, who's, uh, who's talking up, basically, the AI revolution? Today, we are creating neural networks using DNA. You want to create a DNA neural network? Papers are online. We also 3D printed a neural network. So for example, if we, again we have a look at the transportation industry, you want to create a new machine vision learning system for a train, 3D printed neural network, slap it on the front of the train. There you go. And I think I was using the, uh, I think I was using the official language there, wasn't I? Just slap it on. That's it. Or should we say integrate? So we have DNA computing coming through. We have chemical computers coming through. We have liquid computers coming through. We have what we call wet AIs coming through. There's all sorts of stuff. So when we talk about being able to predict the future, if you can see the emerging technologies are here, how they can be combined to create a next generation product or service, and who's doing it, who's being invested in, who's combining them and everything else, you can start seeing how things change. And round and round the wheel we go. However, one of the things that's lost by on a lot of executives is that emerging technology is increasingly powerful. It's also increasingly cheap, but it's also increasingly being democratized. Emerging technology, if you use technology in the right way, you can transform the economics of every industry. It doesn't matter whether it's the airline industry, it doesn't matter whether it's the healthcare industry. You change the economics of an industry. You take the energy industry, for example, we're now talking in Sendrica about the cost of energy going to zero. So again, imagine that basically on a transportation network. If I give you a photovoltaic cell, if I install it and maintain it free of charge for you, or it's just really reliable, I can disconnect you from the grid. You have free energy. We're getting there. The cost of energy is dropping, even though you might not necessarily feel it by seeing through your uh, bills. So I talked about disrupting five industries. So who wants to disrupt some industries? Excellent. OK. Right. So I've picked some in easy industries. This could be any industry. But the first one, virtual stars. So let's have a look at the media and entertainment industry. This is a lady called Taryn. We've recently created an AI called Ampla, so you can go onto YouTube. Ampla is a artificially intelligent AI that's now been signed by Sony. It has half a billion YouTube views. It has 450,000 subscribers. Uh, it's a virtual pop star, and it's been charting. It's not the only one. Uh, we've also got artificial intelligences that are now creating scripts, that are now producing movies, albeit very bad ones at the moment. We also have vloggers online who are virtual. Who, well, so we actually have the vloggers online. You know? So anyone who knows about video blogging, you, know, you end up typically having a millennial sitting at a screen going, oh, I'm putting makeup on, it's great. Um, we, now have vi we now have virtual avatars who are now doing that, where companies like Diesel and Prada are actually sponsoring them and paying them. So we're disrupting the media and entertainment industry. Again, starting to. You fast forward 10, 15 years, if you're an entertainment exec in the A&R industry, do you start signing up an AI? Does the AI get to keep its own IP or its licensing money? How does that work? Financial services. Uh, so recently, mm, not so recently really, about two years ago, there was a company called Ada. Ada is a hedge fund based out of Hong Kong, they also trade in Wall Street. They are fully autonomous. Other companies in the financial sector space are actually start, are starting to follow them. You have companies like Bridgewater Associates, 1,500 staff, $160 billion under asset. They are fully automating the company. So in the future, are you going to be competing against human entrepreneurs or creative machines that can build and scale their own companies. Disruption changes. Disrupting disruption. Now, healthcare. How many of you want to disrupt healthcare? Healthcare is a $3 trillion industry in the US. How many of you have a smartphone? Fantastic. There's at least 10 people with a smartphone in the audience. Uh, so, let's disrupt healthcare. 
And we're doing this with the Max Planck Institute and a bunch of others. Now, if you asked me today, while well, I'm standing here, and you said, look, Matt, you're supposed to be giving a keynote. Um, you seem to be paying much more attention to your skin. What are you doing? I'd say, well, actually, I'm just using the camera and machine vision on my uh, phone, basically, to just to check uh, for skin cancer. And you say, well, okay we, okay, we get that you're kind of ignoring us, but if you're doing that, sounds quite important. Uh, so go ahead. Now I start looking like I'm taking a selfie. And you go, Matt, what are you doing? In fact, I could be taking a selfie. And I go, well, actually, I'm just using, again, artificial intelligence and machine vision just to check myself for pancreatic cancer. Because when you have pancreatic cancer, the skin, your skin color changes and you get yellow eyes, thanks to bilbumen, bilbumen, bilbumen however you pronounce that one. And uh, yeah, this is where I say, look, you really are supposed to be presenting to us. Yeah. Um, I said, yeah, so what, what did you say? He said, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm just checking that I haven't got a fatal heart condition. Now I'm using artificial intelligence combined with the accelerometers on my phone to check myself for atrial fibrillation. And these are all 95% accurate. These are now FDA approved. Uh, however, you know, you now say, well, look, frankly, you are supposed to be presenting to us, getting a little bit fed up. Uh, you know, you seem to be talking into your phone. I said, well, sorry, I was just checking myself for signs of dementia. Because, again, we can use the speakers and all of the other bits and pieces on these phones uh, to check for dementia now. And in addition to that, while I'm still talking into the phone, you say, well, what are you doing now? I say, I'm just checking to see whether or not I'm, not I'm ill. Because, you know, when someone gets a cough, yeah, they sound a bit grovely like that, you know, particularly on the trains. Every time I sit next to someone on the train, they always seem to have something. Uh, it's fantastic. You know, <laughs> shoo. So uh, where's HPC when you need them? Um, yeah, so now these things, because they can detect the very high and low ranges in your voices, they can tell when you're getting ill. And then they can start dialing the virtual doctor. Now what we do is, the reason I've shown you this, is we take all of these different applications, we bundle them together as a service, I put them onto a $50 smartphone for 500 million Africans who have no access to primary health care, let alone the Americans or the Brits, and we're starting to put these into, uh, into the NHS. All of a sudden, I'm disrupting primary health care. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a $2,000 app using AI, machine learning, some training, and all this kind of stuff, I'm disrupting a multi-trillion dollar industry, and I can scale to every single human on Earth that has got a smartphone. Retail. How many of you want to disrupt retail? Retailers have already gone through a lot of pain. They will tell you. E-commerce was the last great disruption. So let's disrupt retail again. So first, we use an artificial intelligence to create a creative stylist. That stylist, say for example you want to order a shirt or a skirt or whatever it happens to be, it goes and has a look at Snapchat and Instagram and all these kinds of things and um, starts designing clothes. It puts those designs onto Amazon. You then use a machine vision camera. You take a scan of your body, so it's now got your, your body dimensions. You use augmented reality to see yourself and see how you look, basically, in those clothes. You decide that you want to order those clothes. At that point, that order is then sent to this on-demand manufacturing machine. And guess who's doing this? So the clothes that you've just bought didn't exist until you actually bought them. It makes these, and then we have fully autonomous shipping and fulfillment. This could be anything. This is Toyota's e-pallet. It's their future car. And we'll come on to that in a bit. So transportation. Let's disrupt Uber. A couple of ways to disrupt Uber. Uber, firstly, we can create a fully autonomous transportation network, something that we're doing in Dubai with the RTA, where there are no humans involved. But secondly, if I'm a platform company like Huawei or Apple or Samsung, What's stopping me from disrupting Uber by simply saying, order me a cab to take me to Waterloo Station? I don't need an Uber app. 
now I'm using the personal digital assistant on my phone. I'm disrupting Uber. It's just mechanics. Now, Uber have scale, basically they have people on the ground, they've got services on the ground and everything else that they can leverage, the network effect. But if you can copy that, if you can mimic it, if you can see it far ahead enough of the curve, you can take down Uber. Still not profitable, by the way. Uh, but as we talk about transportation, you know, and this applies to cars, it also applies to buses, if I get rid of the steering wheel, the dashboard, and I get rid of the pedals, do I have a car, or do I have a bus, or do I have a truck, or do I actually have a pod? Because if you suddenly have a pod that is a blank canvas, and this is the Audi long distance lounge, we have companies like Toyota and Mercedes now developing these kinds of things, if you have a pod, the things that you can do with this is dramatically different. As we talk about trains, we have Mach 1 trains in the form of the Hyperloop. We have Mach 3 trains coming out of China because if you take mega magnets, you can create Mach 3 trains that travel at 2,500 miles an hour. These will be prototyped in 2025. However, if we really want to start sort of stretching the future and looking at how we can disrupt transportation just in general, why not go one step further? Thing about that, we've already trialled it 50 times. By the time that that goes live in 2023, 2024 with SpaceX, it'll have been trialled around three to 400 times. And it's just the FCC are already on board. So what if your daily half an hour commute wasn't from the suburbs of London to inner London? What if it was literally Dubai to London, travelling at Mach 27? And that's it from me. So thank you for uh, listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Thank you.